Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Jackson Crawford. Dr. Crawford is an expert in the Old Norse language, as well as the literature and mythology of the Viking world. He's a former instructor at UCLA, Berkeley, and CU Boulder, and has published translations of a number of Norse sagas and other primary texts. He also shares his expertise on his YouTube channel, which, as of this recording, has 242,000 subscribers. And in this episode, we discuss ethics and beliefs in the Viking world, and what they tell us about the lives of the Old Norse people. My name is Sebastian Weatherby, and this is The Tell. Well, uh, thanks for joining me, Jackson. Appreciate course, it. Of course. Um, when, I, when I emailed you about doing the interview, I really wasn't sure what we were going to talk about, partially because I'm by no means an expert in Norse history or the Vikings or the archaeology of Northwest Europe. Um, and on top of that, the fact that you come from, from the linguistic side of things, which is a lot more unfamiliar to my mode of thinking, which is very archaeological, material culture. And especially since I'm uh, a specialist in, in hunter-gatherers and in Stone Age archaeology, I tend to think a lot in almost like ecological or Darwinian sort, sort of terms. Um, and, and so one of the themes that I was thinking about that I, I was interested in is, is value systems and religious beliefs, how those, how those tend to fit the social and natural environment in which people live. And maybe there would be some Norse text that might touch on that topic. So you suggested that uh, I read the Havamal. The Havamal is, is uh, well, maybe you could introduce it. Uh, sure. So uh, Havamal is a collection of, well, uh, let me back up and, and tell you how we have Hovamal, because it's yeah. part of the story here. Um, Hovamal comes from a manuscript that we know as the Codex Regius or Konungsbok, the contents of which we know as the Poetic Edda. Mm -hmm. uh, these are about 30 poems. I say about 30 because people disagree about where one stops and another one starts sometimes. About 30 poems about the Norse gods mm -hmm. and traditional heroes written down in Iceland in the 1200s AD, but having some linguistic features that suggest that at least some of them were composed before 1000 AD. Mm -hmm. These poems, together with the Prose Edda, a book with a similar name but a different background by a guy named Snorri Sturluson, are our main sources for the Norse myths, the stories mm -hmm. of Odin and Thor and Loki and Ragnarok and etc. Yeah. Hovamol is the longest poem in the Poetic Edda, and it is attributed to the god Odin. It probably is not originally one single poem, but seems to be perhaps five or six stitched mm -hmm. together. The main part of it that people think of when they think of Hovamol is the first 80 or so stanzas. Yeah, yeah. Right, which, I mean, after that, it's not quite the same. But the first 80 stanzas are kind of basic aphorisms for life. Mm -hmm. They're all like proverbs or the wisdom literature of many other societies. Uh, a little bit unique in that they're attributed to the god Odin, but uh, in their general morality and message, I would say they're not that particularly, quote, Viking, uh, which is maybe part of what surprises people. It's often like marketed or billed as a Viking code of ethics. But I think it was actually probably a fairly revolutionary, quote unquote, mm -hmm. set of aphorisms for its time. Which was uh, the 900s? Potentially. Um, you know, part of the problem with the fact that it, th there's not a story structure to these aphorisms, mm -hmm. right? So any given one of them, any given stanza could be older or younger than right. others. It's hard to tell if one had slipped in because it doesn't interrupt an arc in any way. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, it does seem like there must have been some kind of perhaps even centuries-old association of these aphorisms with one another. There seems to be a defined order in which they come, which is strange because it jumps from topic to topic to topic. But there's mm -hmm. actually a place in the manuscript where the scribe has corrected the order of two stanzas. Oh, really? Yeah, it said, huh. oh, I wrote these out of order. These go in this order. It's like, why? They're two totally unrelated thoughts. So there's something from the oral tradition potentially. Some some performative yeah. tradition related to this that 
P potentially. Yeah. Right. Um, so we, we, we just don't know. Um, there are a couple places where the language seems like it demands an earlier stage of the language. Um, so Old Norse poetry, for the most part, is alliterative. Mm -hmm. right? So you're 10 terrible tyrannosaurs on a Tuesday kind of thing. Um, so sometimes the alliteration works in 900s Icelandic yeah. or West Norwegian, but not in 1200s Icelandic or West Norwegian. Ah, okay, yeah. And that's actually one of the major linguistic clues we have that some of this is coming from an older time. Yeah. Um, so the, the scribe in the 1200s doesn't realize that what he's copying sometimes is, quote, good poetry. To him, it looks like bad poetry because he doesn't see that these words <laughs> alliterated 300 years yeah. ago. Yeah. There's still something about the text, though, uh, that's, that's respected or, or traditional enough that they're not messing with it, right? They're not changing these things to make them alliterate, mm -hmm. which is interesting in itself. You know, you look at something like Shakespeare and the way that's passed on in English. Right? You can have a book that's copyright 2022, yeah. but reproduces a text from 400 years before, and the language is that of 400 years before. Yeah, and people yeah. don't try to change Shakespeare to make his rhymes work today. Like Shakespeare rhymes love and prove, right? But because there's an accepted text, we don't try to change yeah. Yeah. love to rhyme with, you know, glove or something in his text. So something presumably similar is going on there. So, so yeah, we, we, I, I guess the long and the short of it is, is I always kind of do this academic thing where I couch it in, yeah, we can never be totally sure about anything. <laughs> yeah. But there's a, there's a good reason to think that at least the bulk of this text mm -hmm. has its origins as an oral composition from a few hundred years before when it was written down. And also there were clues to uh, where exactly in the Norse world it yeah. emerged, right? Um, yeah, that's true. Um, it's actually in in the 30 or so poems of the Poetic Edda, it's the most Norwegian in language. Hmm. So there are several words that survive in modern Norwegian, but not in modern Icelandic. Yeah. Um, which, you know, at the time, there wasn't a huge difference between Norwegian and Icelandic. But it's curious to see, and there are words that are only spelled the way that they're spelled in Havamal, but spelled differently in all the other poems in the manuscript. Yeah. So it's being copied. We actually think it's copied out of a different manuscript than the other poems are, because the manuscript we have is itself a 1200s copy of an earlier manuscript. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the spelling is so different that it looks like it's actually copied from a different exemplar. Um, there's also social language that's more Norwegian than Icelandic, right? Iceland is established as a kind of proto-republic yeah. in the late Viking yeah. age, but there's a lot of talk about kings and princes. Mm -hmm. And then there's physical environment language that sounds like Norway, not like Iceland. Stuff about wolves and forests, which Iceland is pretty low on. Yeah, that leads to one of the biggest questions I had before thinking about anything else in the, in the poem is, who is the audience mm -hmm. for this? Is there a, an agreement on what context this might have existed in, whether it was uh, wealthy landowners in their halls, performed at events, or is this something that would have trick trickled down to the, the common man, so to speak, where, mm. where it was more of a pervasive example of a value system? I think it's a pretty good bet that it comes from an elite social stratum. Yeah. Um, part of that is just the language it uses, which, um, you know, very often says not, um, this is what you should do, but this is what a noble man should do. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. This is what a prince's son should do. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the early settlers of Iceland, uh, at least according to their own traditions, were fairly high status Norwegians mm -hmm. who had fled Norway during the consolidation of power under King Harald Fairhair in the late 800s. So part of what leads to Icelanders preserving so much traditional literature in the first place is this notion that we are the nobles that are that, that are right, the nobility is a little more diffuse, but mm -hmm. it's still very much a, a value, something people believe in. Yeah, there's still a self-conscious association with yeah. the, um, the, the nobility of the old Norwegian world. It's also hard to believe that a manuscript like this would have been produced in anything but a very elite space. Mm -hmm. um, if you consider that the pages have to be made out of calves, <laughs> yeah. right, someone has to plan this out in advance. 
and say, this is what we're doing with the skins off of all these calves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and calf skin has a lot of other uses. Um, someone has to have enough resources to make this book and then to dedicate it to something that's not obviously practical. Yeah, yeah. Right, it's not a law book. It's not a set of homilies for the preacher. Mm -hmm. It's stories about gods no one believes in anymore. Yeah, And yeah. then Havamal, which is... You know, well, it's it, like I said, it's a little bit like Proverbs or something like that. You can certainly get, you know, even today, you can get a lot of good, practical, solid advice out of it. But why did the ink need to be spilled on calfskin for it? I think that's that's an interesting question. Who exactly would want to do this and, yeah. and, and who for? You know, these medieval manuscripts are never signed. Uh, even the prose that, which we know the author of, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, that's not signed. Um, we only know the author because the author's nephew talked about him writing it. Um, we have no idea who in particular wrote this down, and we don't know the names of any of the poets who composed any of the poems. Before I start jumping into particular stanzas that jumped out at me, um, I also wanted to ask, what interests you about the Havamal? Because I know you've you translated it twice? Twice, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll mention what those two translations are first. So in my original translation of the Poetic Edda, uh, published in 2015, my goal was to translate, well, m my original audience for the translation was my students at UCLA. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it to be um, readable contemporary English that didn't call attention to itself. Mm -hmm. Because there's always been this weird uh, conceit among translators of Old Norse that this is old, so it needs to sound old. Yeah, kind of the thou you'll be yeah. sort of vibe. It drives me crazy because in a classroom, it means I wind up being an early modern English teacher. Right. Right. I have to sit there yeah. and explain the students what this crap means. You know, like you're making, you're not taking the barriers to reading away. You're taking down a really high barrier. <laughs> you're ratcheting it down a little. Yeah. yeah. You're still leaving a barrier there. And I have to yeah. spend a day of class explaining what, you know, this weird poetic word order means. Yeah. So right. I thought, I want someone to be able to read this on a bus because realistically that's where students are reading this book. Yeah. So I have just a sort of normal, plain, whatever word you want to use, English translation of it there. Mm -hmm. Then in uh, January of 2012, uh, I remember that I read a blog post by a Norwegian writer who had created something he called Havamal for Dummies. And he had taken each stanza of Havamal and reduced it to one or two words in Norwegian. So basically a stanza that says a wise man should, you know, not say too much, he reduces it to just shut up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought it was really funny. It was really well done. And I commented, you know, this is back in the day of the blogosphere. Um, I commented something like, oh, you know, this is well done. I appreciate it. And he said something like, yeah, and I think that only a Scandinavian could have the relationship with this text to do something like that. And I was, mm. I don't know, offended or something. <laughs> yeah, took it as a challenge. Yeah, because what had attracted me to Havamal early on is it always sounded to me like my grandfather. And weirdly enough, although my grandfather certainly didn't know any Old Norse and did not care to, uh, I always read it in Old Norse in his voice. It sounded to me so much like the kind of advice he would give me. So in one night in January of 2012, animated by this challenge, and um, perhaps by my then whiskey habit, I uh, <laughs> translated it into what I call the cowboy hall of them all. Yeah. Which, well, actually, it's only the first 80 or so stanzas. It's only that aphoristic part. But it takes all of those stanzas and actually turns them into uh, what I think it would sound like if he had said them. And it's not perhaps as literally, it, it's not as literal a translation in terms of the specific words and images used perhaps, but I think in tone, mm -hmm. it's a very faithful translation, maybe the more faithful translation. Because it's, you know, it's kind of colloquial. It's what it sounds like language around a campfire. Yeah, yeah. Jumping into the, the contents of the Havamal, the, the very first stanza actually touched on one of my biggest questions about life in the Norse world. The, the stanza is at every doorway before you enter, you should look around, you should take a good look around. 
for you never know where your enemies might be seated within. And there's a sort of gritty Game of Thrones style pop culture image of the Norse world, which um, which which imagines that that the Norse world was not just medieval and more prone to violence than our lives today, but so dark and so violent that any any adult male that you encounter will inevitably have killed two or three people in their lifetime, and they're collecting notches on their belt to to prove it. And uh, another stanza a little further on, never go even a single step without a weapon at your side. You never know when you might find yourself in need of a spear. I've heard some takes from people imagining that the the early Middle Ages weren't quite so barbaric as we sometimes imagine, but but um, these lines definitely seem to suggest a, a familiarity with violence that is a little bit alien, I think, to a lot of people today. So where do you think the reality lies? Yeah, I think that it's, it's to me, the tone of all of them all is, sometimes people say cynical, but I prefer the word skeptical, mm-hmm. right? No one is trusted just at first yeah, Be prepared for anything, kind of an attitude. Yeah. Um, it's definitely from a violent world. I mean, you read the sagas. So the sagas are actually mostly written down at about the same time as Havamal is. And most of them, well, the really famous ones, are about the uh, Viking Age in Iceland. Mm-hmm. Right? They're already a kind of nostalgic literature, talking about you know, their ancestors a few hundred years ago who settled the island and you know, fought over this place and that place and this whale that came ashore and this girl they both wanted and all that. Right. But they also write contemporary sagas about their own times and they're not any less violent. They're just less romantically violent. <laughs> right. Um, whereas in the, the nostalgic sagas, people have a, you know, a duel over something. Yeah. And the contemporary sagas you read that someone ambushed somebody else and cut off his ear. Right. It's, it's, it's just as violent. It's just way yeah. less romanticized. And I think in some ways it's a little bit like how we tend to handle violence in our own literature and movies, right? You said something in the Wild West, you probably have a relatively, you know, clean gunfight or, you know, John Wayne punches some guy, some guy out. But if you make a gritty modern movie, maybe you show all the blood and gore and guts yeah, and screaming. the kind of darker realism side yeah. of things. Yeah. And I don't know that necessarily our culture is less conflict prone than theirs. I think that their culture is just more willing to resolve things by means of violence. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's less of a faith that words can resolve anything, which is interesting because they're kind of on their way to that. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, many of the sagas have scenes uh, that are basically like courtroom dramas right? because they have a court the thing, mm-hmm. right? It's what it's called. The old Norse word is thing. Um, and in fact, they have a kind of supreme court for all of Iceland, the all thing. You very often see people bringing their lawsuits to the thing, right? You know, so-and-so stole my sheep and I demand payment for this. That, yeah. arguably better, certainly less violent than going and just, you know, <laughs> chopping something off of the guy and telling him to pay up. But the loophole in that system is that there's no police. Yeah. Right? There's no executive function. So if someone says, yeah, Thorgir owes you 40 sheep, you have to make sure <laughs> that you get those 40 sheep. And so it's yeah. probably still going to come to violence somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, this all sounds kind of disconnected. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a violent culture. I don't know that it's as spasmodically, you know, paint the walls red violent as people sometimes make it be, you know, in, in fantasy and sci-fi type movies about yeah, this period or yeah. inspired by this period, you know, the North man or, or I've never seen game of Thrones, but it kind of seems like it's like that. Um, but I think it's certainly, you said something about meeting any adult man and knowing he's killed somebody or somebody mm-hmm. or some one or two people, perhaps. Um, I think something like that might be about right. But if you consider the people that you've ever known in your life who are maybe on the violent end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. that's probably all they've ever done at most, mm-hmm. yeah. right? It's, it's the threat of violence. Yeah, projecting the willingness yeah. to be violent if you need to. Yeah. Um, making sure that people around you know that. 
Yeah, I don't think that it's so much that like Thorgear kills all his neighbors because I mean that's not very practical, and eventually all your yeah. neighbors <laughs> team up against you. It's more like yeah. I hear Thorgear killed a guy once. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Which kind of goes to that that what what seems to be a, a, an obsession with reputation throughout the whole oh, yeah. of the Hopa Mall. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the society as a whole is obsessed with reputation. Mm-hmm. That's actually part of what reinforces that that undercurrent of violence is people in your family expect you to project the willingness to do violence. Right, not just on your own behalf, but on their right. behalf as well. Because, hey, we need these sheep. Yeah. If somebody takes one of our sheep, if they think that we're not going to come hunt them down and hurt them, mm-hmm. you know, all of our sheep are going to be gone. Right, because, again, there's no police. Um, and there's not, <laughs> there's not a lot of material to build fences with <laughs> in Iceland. Uh, it's a little bit like the high plains out here. Um, it, it, so there's this real obsession with am I and are the other male members of my family projecting enough willingness to do violence, even if it very seldom comes to violence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also um, even a kind of legal reinforcement of this because, oh, there's this famous story, one of the very short sagas, uh, the, the short tale of this guy named Thorstein uh, Stangerhog, which means stick beat. Although if you like fancy older translations, it's staff struck. But I think <laughs> stick beat is a little bit closer to the tone. Basically what happens is this guy, um, you know, they don't have Monday night football. They have Monday night horse games. Yeah. So um, this, this guy Thorstein has his stallion fighting somebody else's stallion. And they both get real excited, and they've got sticks they're thwacking their stallions with to get them to fight harder. And the other guy accidentally thwacks Thorsane in the face with a stick. Yeah. Now, he didn't mean to hit him, but there is a legal expectation that you will avenge physical harm done to yourself. Right? So he says, he plays it down. He says, oh, you know, so-and-so, I can't remember the other guy's name. Maybe it was Thor there says, you know, he didn't mean to hurt me. Mm-hmm. But the rumors start spreading. Oh, Thorstein got hit in the face with a stick and he didn't hit back. Right, right. And so matters start to come to a head when Thorstein's dad wakes him up one morning and says, hey, why are you sleeping so late? And he says, well, you know, it's not that much work to do today. I'm taking it a little bit easier. And he says, oh, okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't because you're still hurt because you got beat in the face <laughs> with a stick and didn't hit back. Right. So then everyone else is prodding him about yeah. Yeah, whether he's uh, being tough enough. And yep, and very often it's the women in the family that do this because, you know, it, now and then women take it into their own hands and try to hurt somebody. But more often they're trying to prod the men in the family, right? Like, hey, you don't you remember that he killed your cousin or he stole your ex or whatever and, uh, yeah. and, and keep the men on the boil that way? Um, so yeah, it's, 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 there's definitely an obsession with it and it's a little bit locker room to me, you know, it's not that the guys in a locker room are enemies per se, but there's this sort of common contempt for weakness yeah. that that's, it's kind of like everybody's constantly prodding everybody else. Yeah. Kind of checking them. Yeah. Yeah. And so of course, if someone fails the, the check, um, you know, everybody might pile up on that person and, and, and eventually that person uh, leaves the locker room one way or the other. Yeah. I, I think sometimes the Norse to one another are kind of a locker room culture, right? I think it's that kind of hyper, it's, it's a very academic word, but like that kind of hyper masculine environment. Yeah. Which again, isn't necessarily actually violent all that time. People aren't, because if, if everyone's killing everyone all the time, population gets depleted real fast yeah (laughs) but it's that that willingness to get real close to the edge Mm -hmm. right and not be the one who blinks yeah yeah Uh, and i I think that's a a major component of their society now hovamal is in some ways not a statement of the typical virtues that we see in the sagas Mm mm-hmm uh, one of the really obvious examples there is in several stanzas pretty early on, Odin says, don't drink too much. Yeah, yeah. I was curious about some of those. Yeah. 
But in the sagas, or even in the stories of other gods like Thor, mm-hmm. you see drunkenness all the time. People are constantly getting drunk. Um, there are very few teetotalers. In fact, fairly few people who were even that responsible about their drinking. So it's not stating the obvious morals of the society. It's actually a little bit, if you will, countercultural. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, you won't Slightly hear this. stream. Yeah. yeah, you won't hear this from many other people, but you really shouldn't drink that much. Yeah. But at the same time, it does have some, some it does state some virtues that I think are pretty foundational to society. And, and that concern with reputation is definitely a big one. There's um, a, a connected element to reputation that also struck me a lot is uh, the, the emphasis on, on friendship. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it seemed to me like it was a very particular kind of friendship, which was not necessarily cold um, or, or purely political, but it definitely had a strong utilitarian element to it. Oh, it's very reciprocal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's give and take. Um, yeah, there's several stanzas, especially around like uh, the 40s and 50s, um, about how if you have a good friend, you should do stuff for him because he'll yeah. do stuff for you. If you have a bad friend... There's actually some slightly conflicting advice here because at at one point he says if you have a bad friend, you should laugh with him and you should hang out with him, but, uh, you know, but but be ready to betray them. Yeah, be ready. Yeah, right, exactly. (laughs) Like repay his his treachery with your treachery. The one that uh, seemed to like spell it out most simply was uh, stanza 41. Friends should provide their friends with weapons and clothing. This kind of generosity shows. Generous mutual giving is the key to lifelong friendship. Yeah, generous mutual giving is a huge theme of, of, of friendship there. And in the sagas, too. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, even today, maybe maybe not in all contexts, but certainly anyone who's lived in a, a rural environment has probably considered who would be there if someone in the family needed a ride to the hospital in a blizzard, right? And it's not that you make your friends sign contracts with you, Mm -hmm. but I mean, certainly I would say that there's, there's a a level of friendship at which, yeah, I do expect that you would help me out in some great emergency. And of course I will do the same. Yeah. Right. And I, and I, and I guess you could see it as like, I am, if you call on me to do something, I'm paying in advance for you doing the same for me down the road. Yeah. And it can seem kind of cynical and, and uh, mercenary, but I think reciprocity isn't necessarily mercenary. Mm-hmm. It's just a statement of actual esteem. Yeah. It actually, one of the things um, I've been uh, working for the last six months in Alaska as a, an archeology span crew chief and in um, interior Diné culture, a really important element, like a lot of the cultures of the Pacific Northwest, is the the potlatch mm-hmm. and this sort of ritual gift-giving feasting event, um, yeah. which was all about uh, sort of the big men, like the local important men of the society, bringing their families together. And there'd also be exchange of marriage partners and trade going on. But it seems to me at, um, that a key element of it is this sort of formation of like local alliance systems of uh, family groups for mutual protection. And, oh, absolutely. Um, and, and that's very, very similar, by the way, to something that you see in the sagas mm-hmm. all the time is, uh, and, and actually in the, the praise poetry that you see preserved from the Viking age where someone praises some king or lord, that some of the terms they use for their princes are things like ring hater gold destroyer, you know, the, the one who has contempt for wealth because you're supposed to give it away. Yeah, yeah. If you're one of the top guys, you you are supposed to be constantly giving other people, you know, rings or swords or whatever because not only are you kind of putting on them billboards of their allegiance to you, yeah, but you are kind of buying them, right? You are, yeah. you know, hey, I gave you that sword. I expect something back. Yeah. Um, probably using the sword. <laughs> um, so yeah, a little bit like that potlatch society. Um, and this um, this almost Homeric quality of friendship is one that I've I've noticed also in the few 
some of the few sagas that I have read, like uh, Njal and Gunnar um, in Njal saga, their their friendship is it almost seems as serious as a marriage. This this intense inner reliance on one another and trust in each other, or at least that was the kind of yeah. Uh, uh, Njal and, and and Gunnar are, are are kind of like equally statist examples, mm-hmm. right? And and in a way that's probably a better example of what I'm talking about than the kind of like higher status, lower status thing right. with a yeah. prince. Yeah, two two men of pretty much equal status who uh, help each other out and, and see to each other's affairs when the other is away. Mm-hmm. Um, and a big part of that, by the way, in Norse society is fostering. Um, that good friends foster one another's kids. Oh, really? Even if they don't have to. Hmm. Uh, it's actually something pretty common in the sagas where yeah. basically there's like this sun swap. Um and it's a big deal because you're showing, of course, a lot of honor to the family that, you, you know, like I, I, I respect this family so much, I'm they're raising my yeah, kid. Yeah. Um, but also it's a big deal because it probably it seems like there's kind of a sense that sons are going to grow up a little bit tougher if they're not raised, like, hmm. right at home. Yeah. Um, but then you have these very tight bonds with uh, the foster family. And it's a, it's so it's a little bit like those marriage alliances that yeah, you see in a lot yeah. of societies, but but without that element, maybe because particularly in Iceland, uh, marriage alliances are a little bit of a thornier question with such a low population. Right. <laughs> um, although that remains unsaid in most sagas, you know, to this day they have an app in Iceland. Uh, yeah, you can yeah, check to see in, how close you're related to other people. <laughs> yeah. it, it it definitely also. What you were saying about that sort of um, element of, of trying to show how little you care about material wealth, how the gold doesn't matter as much, the the feast, the food doesn't matter quite so much as, um, uh, you know, your relationships with people and the generosity that you're showing all of them. Um, that seems to really be a, a theme in the Havamal as well of sort of this kind of fatalistic noting of the impermanence of things. Oh yeah, well, there's one stanza where he says that uh, you know you should give things to people that you like now, because you can't count on it going to the people that you wanted to go to after you die. <laughs> yeah, and there was some line like, um, it was like, uh, don't uh, count on your cow until its horns are grown or something, and don't count on your wife until oh, she's already burned. And... Yeah, it's it's don't praise, <laughs> it's it's don't praise different things until yeah. yeah so yeah. it's like don't praise the day until it's night. Don't praise your wife until she's buried. Don't praise your daughter until she's married. Don't praise the ice until it's crossed, which is uh, how I usually sum it up, is don't praise the ice until it's crossed. Um, Yeah, it is fatalistic. Um, And, of course, the society on the whole is quite fatalistic. There's this notion that um, you have a predetermined death day Hmm. and you are going to die on that day no matter what. Um, you don't know what that day is. But it is set. But it is set, yeah. So actually, this is part of what... It, what this, this one is a little bit of feel, but this is part of the kind of mental picture behind a text like Hall of Mall. Let's say my day is uh, November um, 6th, 2022. Is that today or is that... <laughs> uh, yeah, it's today. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, all right. So <laughs> today is my day. I don't know that. Yeah. But... I'm walking out of this library, yeah. say, and somebody shouts, hey, nice boots, jerk. Having certain knowledge that I will die on a given day no matter what, and coming from a culture where there's two afterlives, one if you die fighting, yeah. that's a little bit better, right. and one if you don't die fighting. That guy just challenged my masculinity i'm gonna fight him yeah and if he kills me it was your death day it was my day anyway yeah so if i hadn't fought him i would have have gone home yeah and a a piano would have fallen on me that's interesting i'd actually never thought of that before yeah so this is part of what encourages this very martial i mean martial hyper masculine use what word you want but this 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 notion chicken yeah because like if we're gonna fight and i'm gonna die well i was gonna die today anyway Mm -hmm. so better that i die fighting is another day it you'll you'll be fine you'll you'll win the fight or you won't be right. killed or yeah so how much of a coward would i have been if i had skipped out on that fight that i didn't die in right cuz i wasn't going to die anyway today right <laughs> yeah this is i mean it's it's a once you kind of get into that that particular mental trick if you will yeah you you see how this society definitely leads to people edging each other toward fighting a lot yeah 
and of course the 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 desirable afterlife is the one that you get to only by dying while fighting. Yeah. You know, that's not spelled out anywhere in Hovemall, but it seems like it's kind of a background assumption in a way. Mm-hmm. Although at the same time he actually never talks about the afterlife. And he says, um, you know, the only thing that will survive you is the is the judgment of you. Um, so who knows exactly what the picture of the afterlife was to the, the composer of that stanza. Another piece of the same sort of almost like nihilistic sort of sort of tone that, that the whole thing has is how it seems to treat sex and the sexes. Mm. And um, the first line I found that struck me in this way was talking about women. And it was, no man should trust the words of a girl, nor anything a woman says. Women's hearts are molded on a wobbly wheel. Faithlessness is planted at their core. And then only a few lines later, I found um, the same kind of line about men. It was, I'll speak plainly now since I know both men and women. Men lie to women. We speak most eloquently when we tell the biggest lies and seduce even wise women with lies. Yeah. So there seems to be this general mistrust of anything that we would call love, romance, lust even. That, yeah. um, it is not sentimental about that stuff. Yeah. Um, I think part of what's interesting here is it is a very different negative attitude towards sex than you would see in a very pious Christian text. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the most interesting things about Havamal, actually, is that there's kind of a conventional, you know, you, 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 you can imagine a sort of puritanical attitude towards sex that says, well, well, you know, this is maybe a, a necessary evil, mm-hmm. uh, but you should, you know, avoid touching women until you're married. Yeah. And yeah. then you should only you know, have sex for children right. and, you know, never on Sundays and you don't talk about it. Right. Hovamal is a little bit grittier than that. It's more like, look, it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But don't for a moment, you know, let your guard <laughs> down. Because, I mean, hey, you know, the, the doorway to your, your girlfriend's house is just another doorway you might find an enemy inside, right? Right. Um, yeah, so it's very distressful in, in the relations of the sexes and even handed about it because men shouldn't trust women and yeah. women shouldn't trust men. <laughs> yeah. And he follows that up, of course, with two stories about, you know, when he seduced a woman for uh, an ulterior motive and when he, on uh, another story, failed to sleep with a woman that he wanted to sleep with and yeah. made a fool of himself. Yeah. I think that's another thing that's pretty interesting about all of them all is taking it as the words of a god. It's a god who's not afraid to embarrass himself. Yeah. Not only does he fail to seduce a woman... Um, but he has been drunk and regrets it, right? This, this God <laughs> has, has, you know, made mistakes while drunk that he, he regrets. That's another thing that's a little bit unusual about it with respect to other wisdom literature is that you have this very elevated character, mm-hmm. you know, very often wisdom literature is attributed to someone very elevated, God, a king, yeah, someone yeah. like Confucius. Um, but he's also telling you all this stuff from his own experience. Yeah, more often you'd think the wisdom figure would be kind of infallible, sort of, yeah. if not omniscient at least. But he's the not... All wise. Um, yeah, and he's not just handing this down from the mountain, right? Yeah. It is yeah. much more like, again, reminding me of my grandfather, sitting around a campfire with an older, experienced person who's yeah, kind of seen it all, you know. School of hard knocks kind of thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. he sucks a drag off his cigarette <laughs> and tells you that... You know, you shouldn't trust women, <laughs> yeah. but admittedly, they shouldn't trust us. <laughs> so it's it again to me. It just reminds me so much of someone like my grandfather, and and it's just very plain yeah. uh, attitude toward. You know, it's not just it's 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 not paranoid, right? It's not it's not. Oh, other people are no good. It's well, you're no good either, kind of. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like it doesn't say you're. <laughs> it it you know he says we lie to women yeah right and in, and, in, and in fact later on um, there's a, a quote in, in the context of one of the stories about him trying to seduce the girl or successfully seducing the girl I think Odin had sworn an oath to them but who can trust Odin yeah but you're the guy <laughs> telling us this right <laughs> like it's so it's so chaotic in a way yeah um, and it's and it's not 
particularly black and white, there's not a lot of thou shalt's and thou shalt nots. It's much more like a, well, you're going to do what you're going to do, but, <laughs> but, but stay within these sort of broad uh, boundaries. Yeah, because like when they talk about sort of the inevitability of, of betrayal and unfaithfulness and all of these things, it does still seem to, to imply that uh, they don't like those things, that they expect you not to yeah. do those things generally as social norms. Yeah, um, but it's not a sin culture. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. it's it's not virtue sin. You're not permanently colored by things that you do in private mm-hmm. necessarily in mm-hmm. the, in the same way. It's an honor shame society. Yeah. You might be shamed for something you did. Mm-hmm. You might be honored for something you did. But there's not the same like kind of a permanent black mark on your record in sort of a metaphysical way. Yeah. It's yeah. not the uh, it's not the scarlet letter world. Right. Um, now. That being said, I mean, dealing with matters of sex and adultery, of course, is different standards for men and women as there are in a lot of societies. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, very often in the sagas, the men are sleeping around quite a bit. They may have some concubines, yeah. but women are not expected to do that. But women divorce. Um, and we do see, for example, in Lockstula saga, one of the most famous sagas, um, a lady, Guthrun, who divorces her husband to marry another man. Right, she's not cheating on him exactly in the marriage, mm-hmm. but she's willing to dissolve the marriage, and, and it's treated as a fairly sympathetic thing. Yeah. Um, so it's not, you know, I think sometimes <laughs> we have all these fantasies about the Vikings. Sometimes we paint them as, you know, the super uh, Conan the Barbarian violent types. But then a, a newer fantasy people attribute to them is kind of like feminist fantasy. Yeah, it's like not a fem- egalitarianism. Yeah, it's not. But... There is a more even-handed treatment of... Right, relative to the kind of early medieval world. Yeah, it's, it's more even-handed. It's definitely not <laughs> egalitarian. Yeah. The other thing in the Havamal that I then got caught on was uh, the, the role of Odin. In the account of the runes, the opening line, um, I was going to ask you to, to read, if you would, in uh, the original language. Cause well, hold on. Let me see if I remember it. Veit ek at ek hek, vind ga me the o nether allar niu, geri unda the rock given oathne, siolver siolver mer, o the me the ermangi veit, warsan av rotum ren. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> that line is really, really interesting to me. Well, so I'll, I'll translate what, what, what I said for those listening, listening at home, as they say. Uh, I know that I hung on a windswept tree nine long nights wounded by a spear and given to Odin. Remember, this is Odin speaking to. Given to Odin, myself to myself on that tree. Uh, and then you can translate this various different ways, but which grows from roots that no one has ever seen is the long and the short of, of how it ends. So Odin sacrifices himself on a tree, Yeah. Uh, hangs himself. By the way, in popular c- culture, or I should say just on the internet, for whatever reason, there's this conceit that he's hanging upside down, but that's never stated. Hmm. Um, it's just a meme online that I've noticed. Yeah, just all an the image place. that is caught for people. Yeah, but he just says hang, so I've always figured he just was hanging by the neck because mm-hmm. that's what it usually means. Um, wounded by a spear. You know, if you've read, uh, say, the book of John, there's a fairly obvious parallel that yeah. Jesus also, in a sense, hangs on a tree. Um and is wounded by a spear. Um, some have wondered if there is some influence from the Christian story there. I, nothing's impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, but Odin is very often associated with hanging and with spears. Mm-hmm. And we have stories in the sagas of men being hanged and men being speared and sacrificed to him. Yeah. yeah. So I suspect that he's just sacrificing himself in the way. He expects others to. Yeah. 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 And there's also, is there kind of a Promethean quality to this almost? In well, the sense maybe. that when he's... Um... So he does get the runes. So so he says at the end of this, somehow he learns the runes. Yeah. No one gave me food. No one gave me drink. At the end, I peered down. I took the runes screaming. I took them. And then I fell. Yeah. It's very hard to picture exactly how all of this is supposed to work. Yeah. Is do, do you take that as, as 
his sacrifice earning him the runes? Is this sort of the that seems reward to be what it for is. the sacrifice? Yeah, that seems to be what it is. Because it, it, so first of all, these two stanzas yeah. are the entire story. The story is told nowhere else. So this is so everything we know about other than hanging himself and getting the runes comes from exactly these two stanzas. And we're often in positions like that with Norse mythology mm-hmm. where everything that survives from the Middle Ages is that. Yeah. Now, again, on the internet or in some popular books, you see this blown up to huge dimensions and people add all kinds of details. But these are all the details that are there. Right. Um, that being said, there are other stories of Odin sacrificing things to learn things. So, for example... Uh, he gives up an eye in order to drink from the well of Mimir. Mm-hmm. So we know that he's willing to hurt himself in order to gain knowledge. My guess is that there's a story here that's lost where someone put him up to this somehow. Right? Mm-hmm. I will teach you the runes yeah, yeah. if you hang yourself and stab yourself. Um, he does mention an uncle. Um a little bit later than that, but it's kind of unclear if that's connected to the same story huh. because the uncle's never mentioned anywhere else. Um, so the entire thing is very mysterious. Now, I'm not sure that it deliberately doesn't tell you. It may just be an accident of preservation. This is yeah. just the stuff we have. But it's intriguing. You know, what is going on here? Why does he sacrifice himself? Does he die? What does it yeah. mean if he dies? What does it mean when, to learn runes? When it references runes... Um, I guess, what is the scope of that reference uh, in yeah, terms this is, this is of runes what I mean. as a writing system? Yeah, this is part of what I mean. Is what does it yeah. mean to learn runes? I mean, it's yeah. an alphabet. Yeah. Um, I assume there's some kind of prestige associated with literacy there is, in this era. Um, there is, and there's a vastly misunderstood magical connotation to runes. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, I drive myself to wanting to jump off a cliff from looking at the stuff people say online about, you know, the magic value of this rune or that rune. Or, but in a society where words have power, yeah, right? You read in the sagas all the time, someone curses someone, someone blesses someone. Mm-hmm. All that means is I said, go to hell, right? Or break your leg mm-hmm. in the bad sense, right? Like just saying bad things mm-hmm. can bring them to pass. It's very much our notion of like, speak of the devil and he'll appear. Now, where runes come into this is if I write down what I say, yeah. it's not just lasting for a moment in the air. It's Yeah, you've carved it out in wood there. or stone. Yeah. You've set it a permanent. Yeah. And so we actually find not, again, this, like, I don't know, Harry Potterish notion that there's particular symbols you carve in a particular order and they mean particular things on their own, but we find spells written out, mm-hmm. right? And it's, it's the words that make it magical, but the runes make it permanent. And is there a connection also? Um, I was reading about rune stones, kind of giving myself a, a crash course, and it, it did seem to be these were almost, in, in some cases, either uh, monuments to an achievement or uh, almost like a headstone, like a memorial. Yeah, there. Um, so. Um, I'll distinguish a little bit because because rune stones are not necessarily all of our runic corpus. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of stuff that has runes on it. Yeah, right? weapons, yeah. for example, are often have runes on them. Um, the rune stone practice is um, actually a largely Swedish fashion. Oh, okay. So the yeah. the vast majority of rune stones are in Sweden. Uh, although there's some in Norway and there's some in Denmark. I mm-hmm. don't even know if there's one in Iceland. I don't think there are. Um, but, yeah, they're very often memorials. So so-and-so, who was the son or daughter of so-and-so, um, and then a little bit of information, you know, died at such and such a place or was a good man or something like that, and so-and-so uh, buried him and -and so-and-so carved this. So they're very Mm -hmm. formulaic, pretty simple. Um, Interestingly, not gravestones in the sense that they usually seem to be associated with human remains. Um, So either there were human remains there and they were plundered so long ago that we don't see them, Mm -hmm. or it seems like they're actually not setting them up exactly where they dispose of the remains. They often seem to be along roads, Mm -hmm. old roads, so it's meant to be kind of seen maybe as a statement of a family's prestige. There, there were a few references in the Havamal, it seemed like, to that kind of practice, this mm-hmm. sense that like, if you don't have sons, 
yep. you'll have no one to sort of. Uh, I'm not sure if it actually said explicitly like set up a remembrance for you by roadside, but yeah, he says Bautarstein, which um, sustain is, is stone. Um, you could take that as like basically roadside stone, mm-hmm. yeah. which is more or less probably what thing. That sentence does not have the word rune in it, mm-hmm. but that would be the implication. Something. And is is that an implication to uh, to the runes in, in reference to sort of their magical properties that that um, I don't is think occurring it's, later? I don't think it's magical necessarily. And by the way, most of our rune stones actually are Christian. Hmm. More rune stones are uh, explicitly Christian than art, mm-hmm. right? Though there's a cross, or there's something about you know his his soul. Or it's or the language is very easily datable to a later yeah. period. So it's yeah. not something. So this is another thing that again the very magical online <laughs> people often don't realize. Um, this is a fashion independent of religion. Yeah, yeah. Um, just like you know today in a society that was once a lot more Christian than it is, mm-hmm. people still go on with what are essentially Christian burial rites. Yeah, yeah. Right? A coffin to preserve the body for the day of judgment, which mm-hmm. is put underground. You know, that's, it's, it may not have the explicit Christian orientation anymore, but they're still mm-hmm. carrying on a practice. They're still acting out that, yeah. yeah. So even though it's apparently a practice that started in pre-Christian times, it's very much continued in the Christian times. Well, what to you is a good, uh, a good follow-up to the Havamal, if someone read that as sort of a, a primer because it's short, it's a little kind of easier to uh, read in a short sitting and understand pretty easily. What, what to you is sort of the next step someone should take? Well, I would say a good next step would be to read the Saga of the Volsungs. Uh, I also translated that in 2017, um, so that's available from Hackett Publishing. Uh, the Saga of the Volsungs is, in a lot of ways, the Iliad hmm. of the Norse. Um, it's the story that all the other sagas refer to. Um, it's constantly alluded to in other poetry, and about half of the poetic edda is actually poems about the Volsung heroes. But the saga of the Volsungs is by an unknown writer, like all of them, in the 1200s who took all these traditions about the Volsungs and tried to make one coherent story out of it. Mm-hmm. So it's seven generations of this family that are kind of marked out by Odin. And so uh, initially Odin is helping them but, it, but he, he turns against them eventually. And of course, even if he's helping you, the reason Odin wants to help you is to get you killed in battle so you yeah, can come help him. Yeah. <laughs> so he's it's just always, prepping you to be, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to be his warrior. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a good introduction to the Norse mindset. It's a trippy story, um, and it's pretty short. So that's probably a good next step if you want to get into that worldview. On that note... Thanks for, thanks for taking the time. Oh, of course. Well, from beautiful Firestone, Colorado, <laughs> we can wish your listeners all the best. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Tell. Until next time. Hey, everybody. If you enjoyed the podcast and you want to help me talk to more people in more places, please consider donating. You can do so on my Patreon as a recurring donor, as well as on my website if you'd rather do a one-time donation. The links are patreon.com slash Sebastian Weatherby and www.sebastianweatherby.com. Show notes are also available on my website where you can find citations and comments and other relevant information about the things we talked about today. Thanks again for listening.